Yes. Okay. Yeah. Got a yes. thumbs up. Hey, Ed, how you doing? Hi, Marcy. I've got some good people in here. So we started this idea to do a demo with, um, for Halloween. And I wanted to demonstrate these uh, art supplies because I'm an ambassador, art ambassador for Chart Pack and for Koenor. And they have a great line of art supplies that I keep discovering every year. I keep discovering new things and new ways to use them ways that I have never really thought of before. And I'll give you an example. Um, it was a, about a year or two ago, they sent me, um, Ed, Ed, who's um, the education coordinator, he sent me a bunch of art supplies with, they were markers. And I said, well, I don't really, to myself, I don't really know how I would use markers. I haven't used them in a long time. So what I did is it's a challenge for me to use markers, to learn what's the best way to use them. And also not to just do a textbook version of how to use markers, but to create something special, something that means something to me with the markers. Um, I will apologize for my background. I had did, done a test the other day with a friend of mine, and I was able to put a virtual background in the back, uh, and it was a Frankenstein image. So it was just giant Frankenstein, and I was like between his eyes, and it was really cool. I can't seem to um, get that now though, because I might have changed a few things but that's okay um it's not going to stop us um let's see what we have here so we all started i started this idea to do a six foot frankenstein and what that idea came from um a poster which you may have seen in some of my ads um some of my promos when i was a kid there was this jack davis is a is a uh, an illustrator was an illustrator he was in Mad Magazine, he was in EC Comics, he worked for all the great ones, and he was in TV Guide, he was everywhere. He was a fantastic illustrator, had a lot of caricature, caricatures, and uh, uh, it's, it's not easy to draw a Frankenstein pose like this straight on and make it look interesting. However, I remember this, and I came across this on the web, and I said, wouldn't this be cool? Because as a kid, I loved Frankenstein, I thought, what a great, uh, image for somebody's wall, especially when you're a kid. So I thought, you know, um, my favorite Frankenstein is uh, Boris Karloff. Okay, to me, that's the consummate Frankenstein, one of the greatest movie monsters of all time. Um, when I think of um, when I think of Frankenstein, I think that this is the best interpretation of it. Um, because in all the movies, he always had, you always had empathy for the monster. You knew he was evil. You knew he was doing something wrong. You hated that he was doing something wrong, killing people, whatever he did. But you also had the, um, evoked empathy. You felt bad for him because it wasn't his fault. You didn't ask to be created with a brain of a, uh, criminal a damaged brain. Uh, but anyway, uh, so I, I always return to Frankenstein every once in a while and I love Frankenstein, I think he's the greatest. So I thought, let me do a Frankenstein. So I put this together after this poster. And I thought, now, I don't know if you guys have read the poster, but it's really funny because there's original um, typefaces, original content, never anything like it before, a gigantic, unbelievable drawing of the Frankenstein monster. If you had read comics as a kid, then you would know that uh, they often advertise things that were disappointing when you got them. There was a giant submarine you could order. And in my case, there was a giant Frankenstein, but I didn't see this one as a kid. Instead, I came across something like this. Six foot tall Frankenstein and Dracula pinup masterpieces, life size in full color. Now, I didn't order from this company. I ordered from this one. And I saw this coupon on the bottom. You'll see there's a coupon here. You can see my, um, my arrow. Um, I don't know what this coupon is, if this is an artifact of bad paste up design, like when they would put little um, tape around images as a border, that's what we used back in the day. Um, but this Frankenstein, seven feet tall, I've got to get this, uh, I asked my father, let's get it, you know, and I saved up whatever it was, uh, four quarters for two of them. I got the bony guy 
and I got uh, Boney the Skeleton, his name was, and I got Frankenstein. Now this is a far cry, <clears throat> it's a far cry from Jack Davis, but it's all I knew, okay? So we did order this, cut out that weird coupon, sent it in, and a couple weeks later in the mail, we get this tube, and, it, and instead of this being in the tube, they sent me two skeletons because they were out of the Frankenstein. Can't tell you how disappointed I was. But if you look at this, it's just what it looks like. It's like a piece of polyethylene or something. It's like plastic, looks like garbage bag material. And it was really horrible. It smelled horrible. My mother was yelling at me, it smells, get it out of your room, it's gonna kill you, whatever. But what an inspiration for a kid to try to do something like this. Anything that was tall and gigantic was, was uh, fascinating. As you can see with Frankenstein, before I get into the, the demo, He's everywhere. He was on these model kits. He was on these action figures, whatever they were, uh, standard uh, figurines of, of the day. He even went into um, Halloween masks. If you know this, uh, Ben Cooper, when we were kids, we had these little masks with the elastic on the back of it. They were so cheap, but that was what we loved as kids. And, and I pulled out this poster because I thought it was a great interpretation. Now, I don't know if this was original or if this was made uh, by a contemporary artist who just wanted to reinterpret it, but it looks like an original. And it had that German expressionist uh, um, feeling to it, which I really liked. I thought that was really bold. And I know they did a lot of stuff like that back in the day. They took chances. Now, everything, when you see a poster, it's, if you see a movie poster, it's a photograph <coughs> of the main star, usually a close up or a long shot, but they will never think of doing artwork anymore because it's kind of out of fashion, they think. Show the face, show the, the, the actor that's more important, sells tickets. Uh, just one last look at the empathy behind Karloff. And then, uh, so I wanna tell you about what I did to warm up for this challenge. I did um, a whole bunch of uh, drawings of Frankenstein. And for me, the key was, I didn't know where I was going to begin. I didn't know what I was going to use, but I had all my supplies nearby. And I said, you know what? Let's see what I can do with this. Let's. I want to see where the process takes me, okay? So I didn't set up uh, myself to say, oh, it's got to be done in ink or it's got to be done in pencil or watercolor. I wanted free reign. But to do this study, which was about this big, I think, right? I did this, uh, and I do freehand a lot. I don't pencil things in. I don't measure things. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that's not my way. I wasn't trained that way. So um, I tend to go right into it, and that makes it very exciting for me to draw freehand. And that means directly with the ink or with whatever my tool is going to be. I don't, I don't really get into erasing that much. Um, like I said, no tracing that much. I do trace for jobs, for assignments, for real commercial jobs, but uh, only when necessary. And when I think it's going to serve me, if it's going to serve the job best. So I did that. That was a lot of fun. And you can see I worked into it with paint to try to cover up some of the mistakes. Once I did that, I was like, I got to do something else. So I, I, this is actually after the fact. Uh, but I started actually doing drawings. I took pen, a fountain pen, and I took um, uh, these, these black pencils that I have here. They're aquarels, and they're like all surface pencils. I don't know if you guys could see them. Could you guys see these pencils at all? Can you see a pencil? Just give me a thumbs up if you could see it. Move the white one. Okay, so there's that, right? So I did a bunch of these on um, just regular, picked up a sketchbook, and they're nothing special, but they have some life in them. What's important to me is that by uh, drawing this, it got me to the next step. It's not necessarily anything I'm going to show people or claim that it's a masterpiece or it's an accomplishment, but this is my process. I'm showing you how I approached it. <clears throat> um, I started with some charcoal. I drew all over the page. I erased it with a rag. One of the things <clears throat> I love about charcoal, I use this, um, Grumbacher makes a really good uh, vine charcoal. And if you don't know anything about charcoal, charcoal comes in different weights and different thicknesses. This little piece right here breaks right in half. It's called vine charcoal. This is a medium, which means it's not too smudgy, but it's not, um, it, it's still manipulable, manipulatable, if that's the word, um, malleable, whatever you call it. Um, 
I like to try this effect where you draw with the ink over the charcoal and I feel like while it gives me a bit of an underdrawing, I'm still molding, I'm still molding the image with the charcoal. So I don't feel like I'm too careful and I kind of enjoy that. These are just some sketches. This one I did with um, woodless pencils, which uh, I actually love these pencils. Uh, they're very thick, if you can see them. And this is from Kohenor. They come in uh, sets, I think 24. And I've got a whole bunch here and I threw the box out because I, I always ruin it. Um, messy. I love to make a mess as an artist. I love to see where it takes me. Um, I don't know where I'm going. Like I said, I had the freedom. It's not a freelance job. It's nothing that I had to uh, please a client by sh showing him X, Y, and Z. I did this my way. This is my technique. Some really bad drawings, but you'll see the face. I screwed up. I painted over it. And I just decided not to go back in, but I wasn't crazy about it. This I used, um, this great ink. I think it's this one here. It's Kohenor. Again, the Kohenor is sponsoring me. So I use this uh, Kohenor ink. And it comes in all different colors. And mine's a little weather beaten. But that means I've used it, right? If it's, if it's clean, it means I haven't used it enough, I find. But this is great ink. It comes with a dropper where you can spill it out, you can pour it into a, a little palette cup, or you can do what I do is, is just, I just take the cover off and I dip the brush in there. Um, so I've got a whole bunch of these inks nearby uh, when I'm working because I don't know what I'm gonna do. So I have everything handy. And I think I went in with this, with a little white marker. There's a, they make a Molotow marker. It's like a, a, a paint filled marker opaque paint white and I just made an outline around it might be a little cheesy um, but I go back to the Jack uh, Davis and think about it and these just drawings did my sketchbook with a fountain pen again I'm studying Karloff's cheekbones is the makeup how he's got these dimples here to make his face look more skeletal and skull like and uh, pinched over here and this is more of an exaggeration but uh, whatever I'm doing it's I'm doing it to get me there you can see that I'm not too precious. I even messed up. I decided not to go back into it. I didn't like it, but I, start, I was trying different colors, trying different inks. This is a brown ink and a yellow ink, a little bit of green ink, and you're seeing we're getting different results. I painted over the face so much that the fibers in the bristle board just started coming up. And I said, you know, it's not, not even good. I'm not even gonna bother going over it again and trying to save it. But I do stuff like this because it's fun. Um, here I just sat down, I did a couple small drawings in my sketchbook and I'm on the phone talking to somebody and I decide to paint paint into them and they're not perfect they're kind of crude in some ways uh, like this but they're very fast and I do them for myself to get into the mood I did this it's another small piece I tried to be a little more uh, careful and you know considerate and, and thinking more about how to do the painting um, I found that nothing could compare could prepare me for this. So I'm going to switch over now to the um, to the video part and I'm going to start playing this. I'm going to make it big, I think. At least I think I'm going to make it big. Let's see. Let's see if we can go full screen here. Oop. Okay, can you guys see this all? Give me a thumbs up if you could see it. Okay, so you'll see how I started. Okay, I started with this, um, I'm gonna speed this up a little bit. This whole thing took me about an hour and a half, less than an hour and a half, but I'm not gonna make you stand here and, and look at the whole thing. So I'm gonna play it at two times the speed. It's still plenty of footage here. Um, I didn't really know how I was gonna start except that I wanted to use charcoal. And you can see on the right I have all the supplies set up and it's pretty messy. I like to work messy, not everybody does. It's just my nature. My mind goes from one thing to another and I respond to it as quickly as I can. So I don't have everything set up perfectly all the time. I've got some reference on the right. I've got two images of Frankenstein. I've got the Jack Davis drawing copy that I made and I've got some sketches. They're really just there. By now I know how to draw Frankenstein. I've, I've got the, the skull in mind. I've got the shoulder width in mind. I, can't, I think I've got um, the key features 
And uh, what I really liked about the Jack Davis, I loved how he exaggerated a straight ahead pose and just pulled it off with the shoulders and the legs skinny like that and the giant feet. So I started drawing this with charcoal. And again, this is the vine charcoal, the Brumbacher vine charcoal. And I'm telling you, I love it because I can, oh, here I used a little charcoal holder. I don't use them very much because I just like to use my whole, all my fingers and mess it up and get messy. And if I could find a way to uh, film through my head the next time, I think that would be a good idea. But um, one of the things I noticed about the Frankenstein in the first movie, because there's three key movies with Boris Karloff, um, that he had a jacket with lapels. He didn't have the furry jacket until the third movie. Um, so my, my goal here was after I'd played around and done some sketches, I feel like it got me to a point where I felt comfortable working up with the charcoal. And again, uh, I, I think a lot of teachers, a lot of universities and a lot of students, they use charcoal in a very classical, uh, classical method of charcoal drawing very careful and precious and they erase it and they make it darker and then they try not to smudge it and they make it darker and they erase out the highlights and you can get a very beautiful, beautiful effect. What I'm finding really exciting is to build it up, to just use the charcoal, not be too precious with it. You'll see me take a, a rag and I just wipe out the charcoal and it, since it's medium, it's, it smears everywhere and it's not as prominent it's not really, it doesn't feel like a permanent line by the time I'm done. I can work over it. Um, and I'm just kind of glancing over at the head. And I think you'll see that I make the head, I make some changes in the sizes. Um, you can use a, uh, a rag or a stump or anything, whatever, whatever it needs, whatever works for you to, um, to work over it. But uh, one of the things I like about this is I can work quickly. I can see my progress. If I don't like it, I just erase it and I go over it again. I don't care if it's dark, if I'm getting dirty, if the paper's getting dirty. I feel that um, I'll use that somehow, somewhere in my drawing. Um, so you can see that that's what I'm doing there. Again, I'm just modeling it and I'm not sure where it's going, but it's going somewhere. Uh, I wish that more educational institutions or so would would play around a little bit more with art supplies and not just use them as they are supposed to be used because it's very limiting. If you're learning and you're having trouble drawing and then you pick up an art supply, not only are you still learning how to draw, but you're trying to learn how to use the media. Uh, it's best to use it to learn how to draw. All right. So for me, it's it's really uh, instrumental in building up and it's been a lot of fun. It's, it's a lot of fun. I've been doing a lot of drawings like this over the last year or two. Um, you can see there's that rag. It's an old ratty t-shirt I cut up. And one of the benefits of this too is when you stand up and draw, what's really cool is you're using your body posture and your energy and your physiology, the way you move your body creates an emotional state which enables you to work uh, maybe more effectively. Uh, you know, if, if I certainly, if I did this drawing uh, laying down in a bed, I don't think it would have the same uh, excitement that it does when it, th that it achieved as I stood up and drew. So um, one thing I'll tell people and one thing I've learned is if you're stuck, if you're trying to draw something, you're stuck, you're trying to work out a problem, Stuck means you either need more information or you need to change your approach. Um, often just changing the, the tool, changing the media, put down the charcoal, grab a brush, put down the brush, grab a pencil, put down the pencil, you know, grab something else, get out some, some watercolor or something, do something different, change the size of the paper, the size you're working, change your posture, put the work on the ground, draw on the floor, you know, on the, put the paper on the floor and draw put a paper on the wall. For years, uh, when I was in my mid-20s, I developed a bunch of pinched nerve problems in my neck. 
from doing uh, magazine work. I used to sit at my job, full-time job, with my head down, cutting up and applying typefaces, galleries of, of type, putting together newspaper and magazine pages. And I did this so uh, effectively and so uh, devotedly that I hurt my neck. I, I started getting pinched nerves and it really frightened me. And I thought, you know, my life is miserable with this, these, these pains in my neck. I got to go to work. Yet I want to come home and do my own stuff. I still had uh, you know, dreams of being an illustrator. So I came home. I got an idea to hang up my illustration board. I would tape it to the wall and I would do my work on the wall. And I was good for about two hours and I got tired and I would sit down and then I'd go to sleep after that. So I worked for about two or three hours a night. And um, as much as I could, I could do that a couple of nights a week. Um, but one thing I learned was that, yeah, my energy, definitely the way I direct my energy has changed when I change my posture. Uh, you might notice that he's got really skinny legs. And at one point they look way too skinny, almost look like he has on skinny jeans. And so uh, that bothered me. And I took the, the charcoal and I just erased it. And you'll see I smudged it and I just worked on them to make them look more muscular and stockier and not so uh, tapered and, and petite. Like his hips right now look very petite. I think I went in later and I, I changed that. You can see I'm changing the length of the jacket. Um, I thought that was a kind of a challenge too, to draw the lapels with that suit jacket. It's really a blazer that he's wearing and it has three buttons on it and only one is buttoned and it just kind of makes him look even more awkward. And um, for me, um, it was important to get that, uh, the size to make his hands a certain length, his fingers a certain length. You can see I go over this hand that I'm working on. I go over that many times because I wasn't happy with it until the very, very end. Um, if you guys have any questions, just type them in and, and let me see if I could find the chat. So we got almost everybody here, I think. Um, we got nine chats. Someone said, I'm sorry, I have no camera or microphone, but you don't need one, so don't worry about it. Um, okay. Um, you can see this, you really, you really see this, uh, the hand transform over time. We're getting to a point where we're going to take a break soon and I'll show you some more things and then we'll go back. We'll go back to finish it. Uh, this is a really fun assignment for me and that I gave myself. Uh, find something empowering about working big. Uh, that's just a, a kneaded eraser. It's kind of rubbery. It's it, you can pull it apart like silly putty if you remember that and that's just something I'm trying to pull up some of the dusty residue on the charcoal um, Again, it's it's all just to make me Make me get to the next step whatever that might be and I still don't know how I was gonna end I still don't know what I'm gonna do next Somebody asked me, will we actually be drawing? I have pencils nearby. And um, my, my demo is not for to intend to teach people to draw, but just to share my process. You're welcome to draw while you're doing this. It's totally fine. Um, I encourage you to draw whenever you want. Um, maybe next time I'll do something where we could have a little more instruction, have actual instruction instead of just a demo. Um, Now I'm, I'm trying to get, I'm looking at the, the face and I'm trying to um, really emphasize the, the, the makeup and the, the, the bulbous eyebrows, a ridge, the arch over his eyebrows. I think I still go back into the legs to change them. It's still way too skinny here. Uh, when I was a kid, I loved Frankenstein so much that um, 
I made sort of this, this helmet. I took a paper bag and I fit it over my head. It was just small enough to fit on my head. And I took masking tape and I wrapped it around my head. And then I pulled that off and I stuffed it with stuffing to keep it thick. And I used paper mache. Well, actually, I cut the paper bag out so it would fit like sideburns over my ears. So now it's like a helmet. And I used paper mache on it to harden it and I made a Frankenstein mask. I'll tell you more about that later. What I'm doing now is I'm taking this yellow ink from Kohenor and I'm starting to paint in because I don't know what I want to do, but I, I just kind of want to react to something. Right away, I notice I don't like the ink because it's, it's um, getting soaked up by the craft paper and the paper is already starting to buckle because it's so wet. I also have a, a little container of water on, my, on the table next to me um, that I use to regularly dip my brush into that. Um, so you see, I, I'm, I'm right about the point where I change my, my approach. I say, you know what, this is no good. See, I'm, I'm closing up the ink and I believe I'm looking to bring out some highlights. And so you'll see, I go into it with this white crayon, which is, I think is a woodless pencil or a white China marker. I can't really remember. I don't think it's giving me what I like. It's giving me a little bit of, um, uh, contrast, which is great, but up close, it doesn't look, uh, like it's covering enough of the paper. The paper is a little bit bumpy, so it's got slots of the paper showing through. I want it to be as dark as I can get it. Um, I want it to be very opaque without the textures sticking out. So I struggle with this for a little while, and then I, I actually, um, you'll see I actually get to a point where I step away, and then I come back, and I make some drastic changes that take me in the direction I want to go. And if anybody has um, if anybody has questions, I hear some background noise. Could somebody, if somebody's got their microphone on, um, please mute your audio. I don't know what that is, but. Um, Sounds like it's interesting. Uh, somebody wants, uh, somebody had an idea. I should ask what your favorite Halloween monster is. So that's a good question. Actually, you might all have a favorite monster. Mine has been Frankenstein because of the empathy. Next one would be King Kong because of the empathy you feel for King Kong, just like Frankenstein's not his fault that he's uh, let loose on society. And then I'd say probably the third one is, uh, the alien from the Ridley Scott film. I think those are the, might be the three greatest monsters on screen. Uh, you might feel differently. You might have others. Feel free to share them. Somebody said Jason from Halloween. And is Boris Karloff my favorite Frankenstein? Yes. Um, I don't know if you guys remember, there's a few people that, oh, I see somebody's drawing. Nice, I'm impressed. Nice job, Gina. All right, here's a good place to take a, a break. I just zoomed into the drawings that are on my wall so you can get to see them up close. Um, that's really all it is. It's just me doing a couple of drawings, getting ready. Somebody wants to know if I've ever drawn the Predator figure from the Predator. I don't think I have, but I would love to. He's a great monster as well. So I'm going to come back to this now. Um, this could be like a, you guys want me to continue or take a break and, and answer a question or anything? Oh, Creature from the Black Lagoon, Tom says. Yeah, I agree. He is, might be the one of the greatest designs and monsters I've ever seen. American Werewolf in London. That's a great movie too. That's an awesome one. I would say, um, good thing to think of if you ever want to try drawing yourself, like if you wanted to recreate your own Frankenstein, I'd say keep in mind that the shoulders are really big. He's got big shoulders. He's got long, lanky arms. 
And one of the keys, if you'll know, they always give him a short sleeves, uh, long sleeves that are just not fitting him. So his arms extend from the sleeve, making it even, making it appear even uh, longer arms than one would have. Um, again, there's the brow, there's the, the top of the head, which is not actually square as we kind of stylize it over the years, but it's uh, got a little bit of a round dome to it. And um, the eyes are another thing too. Uh, you want to make his eyes look sunken, giving him dark circles, like, and it gives the illusion that they're deep set. And then he's got these almost like sucked in where his cheeks, where his teeth would be. Um, so the more skeletal you can get his face, the, the more you're going to get that effect. Look at skulls, look at, you know, an anatomical skulls and see what they are. Uh, someone wants to know if, uh, Anita says, what are the best pencils to use? If I want to sketch a picture of a pond or a lake, do they have to be expensive? And the answer is no, they do not have to be expensive. I would encourage you to use whatever you have and uh, find something you like to draw with. Take a couple of different styles of media and um, go into it and, and, and you know, work with that. Uh, you can go online and get them at Blick or Jerry's uh, Artist Outlet, which is a group. Probably the best art store I've been in is Jerry's Artist Outlet. That's in New Jersey. I forgot where exactly, but uh, they have a great selection of everything and they're all professional. They know exactly what you're talking about. If you ask them something, they'll know what to tell you. You can see now I'm going in with, um, I'm going into this with some ink now. You know, I've got a dark ink. I'm not sure if this is brown or black, but it's, it looks like something like this. Um, I like Hagen's black ink. It's black indie ink. It's been something that uh, I've been using for years. It's something that um, a lot of comic book artists will draw the outlines of the pencil drawings, still used indie ink. Um, Hagen's makes a great indie ink and they also make one called Black Magic. Um, now what's the difference between the Black Magic India ink and the regular Black India ink? The Black Magic ink is very unique because it has some kind of a varnish added to it. And it's very, very strong. It's very, very dark. It just looks a little bit more impressive. And you really get the opaque quality that you're looking for. Um, you know, when you have black ink, you want it to be dark. You don't want it to be see-through or transparent. I personally don't mix a lot of water with my black magic ink because it's so, it's such good quality. I don't want to dilute it. But I'll take a regular ink and I'll dilute, dilute it with water. Uh, just by dipping my brush in the bucket and then I'll have like a um, like a rag nearby and I'll just test it on some paper to get it to the right liquidity that I need. Someone wants to know what am I most proud of that I drew? Uh, that's a good question. I really don't know. I mean, I'm definitely proud of the, the work I did as a Disney animator. I did a lot of work with the uh, Character animation, I animated Stitch on Lilo and Stitch. I animated Mushu from Mulan and uh, on Brother Bear, I animated Coda and I did Emperor's New Groove, Pacha, and um, I actually got a chance to draw Tigger and Goofy for something that was in the park and another one that was a, a short film. We did a goofy short film that was a pleasure to work with that. We got, we got to work on original, from original drawings that the original animators had used years ago. We actually studied those to try to get the best, uh, best um, quality on model drawings, as they say. Um, oh, Ed Brickler's telling me, uh, Jerry's Autorama is in West Orange, New Jersey. If you're out there, if you're nearby, I think it was one of the best, probably the best art store I've ever been in. Um, the management is amazing. Uh, Bonnie and Alan, I think, run the store. They're really good to me. And I just, the staff is so impressive. They also have um, events in the store. I don't know if they still do it now with the pandemic still going on, but I did a, one or two events there. They're really good. Really, uh, really well run. 
<clears throat> this is craft paper. Again, it's like the cheap stuff you could just buy it anywhere. I bought it at Staples or somewhere. I don't even know where I had it. It comes in a roll. And for this type of experiment, it's great. You know, just roll it on the wall, do it on the floor. When uh, um, my kids were young, we had a, a, a big rainstorm for like the weekend. We were in the house for like a week. But this one weekend, I remember it was really bad weather and we we're going to stay inside. So we could watch TV, play games or whatever. But I, I said, well, let's get the pencils and the crayons out. And I, I remember rolling a big roll of paper on the floor and it just got everybody, let's draw. Let's just do whatever. And it was a nice little moment. I doubt my kids even remember it now. But it was fun for me. Um, Leo wants to know, is this my hardest drawing? And I would say, no, it was not my hardest drawing. Uh, this came pretty natural to me. Uh, I feel really good about it. Um, and uh, what else? I think one of the, the hardest things I drew was Stitch, actually. Um, I just... I was kind of grumpy when I worked on him. I don't know why. It's just very hard to draw. And the standards were very, very high. And um, I think I came around in the end. But it took me a while. I was fighting it, you know. Um, but I also drew Coda from Brother Bear. And that was, it was a lot easier, I guess, because I went through such a challenge on Lilo and Stitch. that when I got to Brother Bear, it was way easier. Uh, just to talk about what I'm doing now here, uh, I decided to use a brush, and I'm using, um, I don't know if you guys could still see me. Can you still see me? Is my image still on the screen somewhere? Okay, so I use this uh, sort of like a broad brush, and this is a Grumbacher brush, golden edge, three-quarter size. It's a flat, and I basically dipped it in the ink, and as you could see, uh, um, I'm just kind of modeling the form of his arms and his body with this. I'm thinking, well, this is a good, when I say dry brush, I mean that the paper doesn't absorb all of the brush stroke, either because the brush has been wiped dry on a side piece of paper, like I'm doing here. On my right, there's a piece of paper. I'm kind of dragging it along there sometimes, and I'll also dab it on a, on a rag. And that'll remove some of the paint so it's not such a um, uh, viscous stroke, I guess. Um, and it's just almost like just feathering over the, the paper with the brush to get the dry brush, to get this stroke effect. It ends up leaving like a texture on the paper instead of just a solid black line. It's giving you some texture. Um, here it looks like I poured some ink onto my palette tray uh, and I'm just uh, getting a little more aggressive with it. And you'll see as I'm going, I'm kind of figuring this out. This is not, again, it's not something that's a tried and true method I always do. Uh, one of the great things when you do uh, stuff for yourself, again, nobody's asking you to hand it in and look like a certain thing. You can just see where it goes and often I think that you get some really good results out of it. <clears throat> if, you want, if you wanted to, somebody asked me if I, uh, Antonio said, do you ever draw a monster for a storyboard job? Uh, that's a good question. If I did, I don't remember it at the moment. I know I drew some zombies for a commercial. Um, and I probably drew a couple of monsters, but I don't think I ever drew a Frankenstein or anything like that. Because um, he's asking me because he knows I do a lot of commercial work. Um, it's always fun, though, to get to do these types of projects. Um, I'd say if you guys, if you are interested in, in practicing drawing or starting up, good thing to have is a little sketchbook. Um, just any sketchbook doesn't have to be expensive. Doesn't have to be fancy. Doesn't have to be the best paper. Uh, and I would say I always recommend that you're not too precious with your approach. Just take take your time, and experiment, and see where it takes you. You know, if you have a pencil, 
There's no law that says you have to use a pencil with an eraser or that you have to use the point and it always has to be pointy. Use the side of the, of the, of the edge. I mean, use the sides of the point. It's a broad, you can get a lot of broad strokes and, and discover some nice things that make a lot of progress in your drawing. Um, somebody, uh, Greg asked me if I have a favorite media to draw with. I'd probably say it's ink. I love to use uh, pen and ink. I take a, uh, a crocal pen. I have them here. Yeah. Take a pen like <clears throat> this, and I, I don't know if you can see this. Looks like a calligraphy pen, maybe, or something like that. Uh, um, but I'll take this and dip it in the ink. And again, I draw all over the place, and I'll try different nibs, different sizes, different shapes. Uh, I'll often go to the art store, and a good art store will have these in stock. A lot of art stores over the years, you don't find these. They, they, they tend to be, um, there's a handful of professionals that use these all the time. And they buy the whole package. They buy the whole box. You're not going to find any more left. So if you can buy them online, you buy them. If you would like to know what they are, I'll, I'll be happy to recommend a few of them. I'm no expert, but I, I do use a lot of different um, inks and pens and brushes and things like that. Um, nowadays, you can get um, brushes that, are, that come filled with ink in them. They're like disposable. Some of them are refillable. Those are great to, to try as well. Uh, for some reason, I can never seem to recommend one because I'm always um, uh, I'm always letting them dry up or messing them with the brush somehow, and I fail to take care of them. So somehow it just goes away. Someone has said, "Is it like a fountain pen?" Um, Maria asked me. I'm not sure what you're referring to. If you're referring to the pens I'm talking about or this that I'm using now, right now this is a brush. Uh, three quarter of an inch brush nib, uh, uh, brush tip, I should say. And if you're ever looking for the the Higgins ink that I mentioned, it comes in a box like this a lot of times, but you won't always find it in a box. Sometimes it'll just come in the container, in the tube. And you'll notice these are like wide on the bottom and thin on the top. Uh, it's, so it doesn't fall off your desk as easily. It doesn't tip over as easy. Um, they make a white ink, which I love to play with. I don't always find that I know what to do with it because it's not always opaque. Uh, the thing with white ink is you get brushes to be really clean. You got to stir it up sometimes and shake it up like this. And when you get to the bottom, you'll see that it's a little thick. And that's usually more effective at, um, you know, making an opaque covering of something. Um, white is really good if you can let the white of the paper just come through. But when you have to use white, it's good to have an opaque one. So in this case, as you'll see, I haven't gotten into it yet, but I've got a bunch of Grumbacher paint tubes, acrylic paint. You mix it with water, cleans up with water easily, dries fast, so be careful. You got to work a little quicker. We'll learn how to work with a, a glazing method where you put down a layer, let it dry, put down another layer and just build that up. Um, um, uh, as far as the fountain pen comment goes, I do like to use fountain pens. Um, oh, Ed Brickler says, uh, Higgins has a super white ink. I don't think I have it here, but um, I'll give it a shot, Ed. I'd like to try it. Um, I chose the craft paper uh, because I knew it would give me something more to react to. Um, I love drawing on white rolls of paper. And a lot of my training uh, was just white paper, just piles of white paper, rolls and reams of it. And um, with the craft paper, I knew I would react. It would give me another element to react to. What's cool is if you think about uh, dark light and medium values, right? The craft paper is almost in the middle. It's like third, it's like maybe, I don't know, 40% of a gray, if it were gray. So all you have to do is make one aspect of it dark and the other aspect of it whiter. 
and the craft paper lives in the middle somewhere. So you have this balance of real life uh, shadows and contrast that you would have, that you would recognize in real life and you can play with that a little more effectively. Um, somebody said, why did I, how did I get started? Greg asked, how do you start? How did you get started in the art field? Um, when I was in sixth grade, I made a serious decision in my head. I loved drawing comic books so much that I, I said, I'm going to be a comic book artist, right? And when I was a kid back in the day, there were no art schools that taught comic books. There was, there was really no comic book stores around. It was very hard to find anybody who had a passion for comic book characters like I did. Um, so it seemed like a very singular goal and a singular profession. My parents saw that I had some talent. They were very, um, very supportive in the sense where they didn't really know anything about the industry, but they said, Hey, you have talent. I remember my dad coming home from work and he walked in my room and look over my shoulder. He said, eh, keep it up, kid. You're doing good. Are you doing good work, kid? Uh, you have talent. You'd say you have talent. Uh, that little, that little bit of encouragement went a long way with me. Um, and, uh, Fortunately, they always um, encouraged me, you know, to study hard and go to school and all that stuff. And they allowed me to, they trusted me, which is, uh, it was a big step, I think. So you can see here, I'm still, I built this up a lot with the brushwork. It's just dry brush. Again, I'm scumbling, sort of feathering and scumbling right over the surface to build up that. And I'm starting to think it's, it's actually uh, coming together nicely. Uh, Nita wants to know, when do I know if a painting is finished? Uh, I just try to evaluate, is the main area of focus that I want you to look, is that done? And then uh, part of it is um, intuition. You, you use, you add into it what you want. Do I want to go further? It's really up to, up to me to make a decision. Um, I can usually tell if it's for a client, I can usually tell right away. I know exactly where it has to go to make them happy and uh, in the time that I have, in the amount of time that they give me. Um, uh, Marcy, nice to see you, Marcy. Uh, Marcy said, have I ever used roofing paper? No, I have not. I'd like to know if you recommend it. Tell me what your experience is using roofing paper. But I'm sure it's, uh, I'm not sure if you're painting on roofing paper, but it, it sounds really interesting. I might try it. Hold it. I can show you in right behind me. This is a portrait that was done with roofing paper as the background. Wow. Is there, is that like an arm yeah. that we're looking at? Let me see. Oh yeah, hands. That's beautiful. Yeah, this is, um, it's actually a portrait someone did of me years ago. Wow. That's roofing paper. And this was done in one sitting and it took about, I would say he did it in about a half an hour. Wow. Can we see the face? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's nice. Looks like Modigliani a little bit. Huh. That's beautiful. Yeah. What kind of paint was he using? Oil. Very nice, Marcy. Thank it's you. a good thing. I have to look into that. Yeah. It's roofing paper. And it's amazing because it has a lot of texture. Hmm. If you can see the paper itself. Yeah. I, I think it's pretty cheap. So I think it's something you might, and yet it's a little more interesting than craft paper. I'll have to go to the hardware store. Yeah. And look down the aisles, right? Yeah. Great. Thank I'm, you. I'm enjoying watching you do this. It's really, really fun. Glad. So glad you tuned in. I know it was late notice. Yeah, but I'm so, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, always, always. Marcy's an artist that I, I met. Um, the Untermeyer Garden. At, at Untermeyer Park in Yonkers, one of the best kept secrets in Yonkers. Uh, it's like a classical uh, European style garden with different plateau levels. And there's a thing called the Temple of Love on the Hudson River. Really, really beautiful. Uh, I saw a picture with John Lennon. I took a photo there, John Lennon in the 70s. And they actually, I think they actually put it on the outside the outside the display you can walk up it and everything what a nice place it's about 45 acres i think so beautiful 
yeah, it's so it's so beautiful. It looks like there's a area that looks like the Roman uh, what do you call it? like where the, they used to discuss uh, the outdoors. They would sit around and discuss uh, amphitheater. But yeah, the amphitheater. Yeah. It's, I think it's based on, it's actually a Persian garden with uh -huh. reflecting pools and uh, um, the, sort of those outbuildings that uh, around the pools and yeah. incredible plantings. It, it, uh, just a great place to go. Everyone should try to, try to migrate over there and see it at some point. Yeah. Drop off of the Croton uh, Aqueduct Walk. Yeah. So, Nearby, uh, right? Yeah. Okay, if you notice now, let me just jump back to this. Um, yes. Let's see, um, I've got acrylic paint, and I'm starting to introduce the paint. And it's, I don't know if you could tell here, but it's starting to give a coloring to the, um, to the face. It's almost, it uh, seems like it's turning purple. It's turning the ink, uh, which is brown. It's got a brown ink, and it's, it's kind of turning it a little purplish. And I kind of use that. First, I didn't like it. I'm like, ah, where's this going? But I think at the end, I kind of made it work somehow. And you could see that hand, uh, you know, I think years ago, or like a, a beginning artist, they would get kind of um, uh, nervous. If they start to see a result that they're, they don't like, they would, might, might want to give up. But over the years, uh, unfortunately, I had some good training and I work over things. You know, I'm not afraid to work over it or erase it or change it. Um, one of the things I like about Picasso, if you've ever seen that film where he he does a painting, I don't know if it's 20 minutes or whatever it is, and they play some jazz music and he's just painting and you only see the brush stroke from the back of the canvas and he's just painting and painting and painting and then you think it's done. It's kind of abstract. And just as it's done, he starts painting over it again. He does another 10 minutes and it's totally from painting when it's done. But the idea that it's not precious, that it's something you want to develop wants to take you somewhere. Um, if you use charcoal and you use it um, where you want to save the drawing, it's definitely going to smudge. So they make a spray, a fixative spray, but I'm very uh, hesitant to use them these days because I must have inhaled so much of that spray over the years. Um, I remember back in art school, staying up all night to do a painting or a drawing, and then I want to spray it to protect it and go outside, maybe in the middle of winter, and I put it on the sidewalk and I would spray that thing and it stinks. I mean, it's a carcinogen, no doubt. Um, I have to see if Ed's still with us. Ed, I think you mentioned that there might be a, a, an alternative to the uh, poisonous, dangerous Krylon sprays that we all used back in the day. Uh, there was, when I worked at Disney, we had a spray booth for people who were doing this, whatever they, whatever they did. If you did any kind of uh, spraying of something, I used to spray a lot of the storyboards that I did. You go in a spray booth, turn the fan on, and it's just these exhaust fans over a table, and you wouldn't even smell a thing. It would just bring it all, all the fumes would go out through the filters, and um, that's something that's very expensive. Nobody has those at home, you know? I've heard you could, Greg said, can you use hairspray? Yes, you can use hairspray as an alternative. But again, I don't know that it's healthy for you to use. I would not inhale it. Okay, thanks, Ed. Ed says, uh, Grumbacher, workable fixative, or Blair, low order, workable fixative. And uh, Ed, I'm not sure if those are carcinogens or if they're uh, sort of like a green alternative. Uh, maybe you could let me know. Oh, Ed says, um, hairspray is not archival. So it's possible it'll, it'll turn your paper a different color over time. Um, I don't really think too much about archival, but it's important, especially if you're gonna sell your work, people want to know it's gonna last a hundred years. So here I'm starting to get a little, little bold with the, the white, but I think it's working. You know, I'm, st I'm starting to see like, can I show a, a bone structure or uh, you know, uh, ligaments or musculature where it needs to be. And so I'm getting a little more aggressive. Uh, unfortunately, you can't see the bottom, but I'm just making those boots a little bigger and longer. I feel like that's a key element to Frankie Frankenstein. 
So as answered me now, he says, uh, there are no non-toxic sprays. You need to use ventilation. The bathroom vent fan works. Um, I've never tried a bathroom vent fan. I, I don't think I would try it in my, I don't even think I have a vent fan in my bathroom. But um, whenever I have used that stuff near people, near a house, whether it's opening a window and going on a, uh, you know, out the door, it always seems to smell. You can never get away from it. Even you bring the, the, the drawing back in the house, it still smells. It smells for a couple of days at least, you know. So always open windows. You could wear a mask. Something I should have done years ago was wear a mask. I don't have the proper mask. It's just one of these uh, masks we use for the pandemic. It's not going to keep any chemicals out. I don't know. I don't know the type of respirator. I'm sure there's other people. Antonio, if you're still here, you might know what kind of um, mask would be good to um, avoid fumes, inhaling fumes, some kind of uh, safety safety feature. So this is almost done now. I'm getting tired of looking at my the back of my head and my fat stomach. Um, but it is funny. So now we're about an hour and three minutes into the demo, but it's on fast mode. So it's almost done. I see that there's about one minute left. Um, and I'm thinking, no, should I add some color, some red, some green? And I say, you know, I'm just going to leave it alone. I think it's in a good place. And, um, and that was it. I just wrote a little thank you to the Kohenor uh, staff they helped me put this together they were very supportive of it and then i thank my wife stacy my friend tony and my friend art and my kids for putting up with me olivia and ruby putting up with my uh, mania i'm gonna um stop this i'm gonna get out of this somehow how do i get out of this thing uh let me share that Stay with me, ready? Uh, exit full screen, okay. I'm gonna go back to this. Screen sharing is paused. Have I paused? Am I still paused? Let's see. I'm gonna zoom share. Okay, I'm still here. Can you see me? Okay, great. Uh, so if there's any uh, follow-up on this, I just wanted to go over again real quick. So that's my first phase, right? Start with a blank sheet of paper. And I allowed myself the, uh, the time to experiment with it. That's me taking a little publicity shot there. That's the whole thing. Now, it's, I know I advertise six foot, so it's kind of a mislead, a misleading uh, tagline however the paper was bigger than six feet my intention was to make it as big as i could so uh i apologize if it's not exactly six feet but it's still kind of fun that was the uh empty sheet uh you'll see that was the that was my first phase then i started to go into it with the white i didn't like the way the white was coming out so i went to the finish with the dry brush and again here's the close-up of the face uh, Karloff with the makeup, his eyes are very heavy. He's got really heavy lids. And um, I tried to really knock those out a little bit. His thick eyelids, I'm sure he's wearing a lot of makeup on his eyelids. You can barely see the, the round, the black dots in his eyes. Um, someone asked me if the drawing is for sale. I would be happy to sell it uh, anytime. You can reach out to me <coughs> through my email or um, text me anytime, or however you'd like to. Um, so I was really trying to get, I really just studied this head on the side. I really loved the way they made him look like he's just got these, you know, sucked in cheekbones. Uh, and that's it, it's a little bit more of a close-up. You can see a little bit more of the, the details in the hands and stuff like that. Um, not a bad effort for a, a fun little job, right? I think it was pretty good. What do you guys think? Good? All right. Well, listen, uh, if uh, there are any more questions, I'm happy to answer. Uh, I got to thank everyone for coming out tonight and, and just spending time with me. I know an hour 
of your time is a lot to uh, dedicate. And it's very generous of you just to give me that hour. So thank you. And I uh, hope to see you again sometime at our next, uh, next demo. All right. And thanks again, Ed. Nice to see you, Ed. I'll see you guys soon. Happy Halloween. Thank you, everyone. All right. Any, any questions, anybody? Can I draw Barney? No, I can't. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you. Oh, Gina. Can you activate your um, microphone? Hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> I raised my hand, but... I, I want I really... to see what you're drawing on the wall. I, I, you can't really see it. Can you see it? No. I, I, see I drew what paper. you were doing, but just with a light, like a light pencil. And uh, I, I, but I, I need mean, your phone. Take a picture, maybe, with your phone. And uh, wait a minute, I'm gonna I, move over. <clears throat> Can you see that? No, no. I just see the paper. Yeah, I'm really, yeah. I'm really impressed that you went that far to actually hang up paper. I mean, that's I didn't. No, I thought that's what I was supposed to do. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I have to give you a private lesson now. You have to. I sketch. I think his legs came better than the the suit jacket and the um i don't know I, I feel bad i can't see any of it i i think i did the i don't know i just did it light it's very light yeah it doesn't pick up on the camera that's the problem yeah it's a glare from the the, the ceiling the light the way the ceiling fan is hitting the paper it's a glare but maybe in the daylight it'd be better yeah but. well you're a good uh yourself a teacher <laughs> it's for many years now I teach music and other things and uh, there was one student in the group in the beginning and she dropped out I don't know what what happened oh uh, must have bored <laughs> I didn't see she didn't say anything so all right she told her Harry Styles was gonna come make you guess <laughs> no okay uh, okay that's it guys all right I'll be reposting this Anytime, one of these days now, I'll put it up somewhere. You could look at it anytime you want. Reach out anytime. So glad you guys came. Uh, okay. Check me out at TonySanto.com, my website. I got a YouTube channel. I've got uh, Instagram. We've got Facebook. I've got ArtStation. I've got a lot of stuff. Um, pretty, pretty decent web presence. But uh, again, thank you so much for coming out. I appreciate it. Okay. All right, guys. Good night. Good night. Good night Love everyone. you. Bye-bye. Love you too. Take care. Bye-bye.